This morning uh, we're going to continue our study in Philippians, chapter 3, and uh, I thought last week was awesome. Uh, Phil spoke to us, Phil Edwards, on running the race. I enjoyed that, I got a lot out of it. And this message that I am continuing on with is the very next verse, so there are some very similar themes here. It's good for Phil to speak about running. He does that for a living. He gets paid to run after people. I don't do much running. I'm a truck driver, so walking is about the fastest you'll get out of me. But Phil uh, spoke a lot on, um, about the race of life that we're on as Christians. Remember, he spoke about not looking back uh, and everything was, uh, and using our past as our testimony, supporting each other along the course of life, staying humble in the race as it's not over yet, and looking forward to that finishing line. And this morning in Philippians, as I continue on from where Phil left off, we will also be looking at the finish line. And it's great, and I trust this morning that uh, we will uh, go away from uh, church this morning, built up and encouraged and looking on for the Lord. If I could just look at our second PowerPoint, we're going to look at three things uh, this morning, because I'm talking about walking, as Paul said in chapter... 17, joined together in following my example, brothers, just as you have as uh, us as a role model, keep your eyes on those who live or who walk as we do. So he's, Paul's always referring to something in the way of athletics, it's just uh, something that was in the culture at the time, so he, he often spoke like that. So we'll be looking at ways to walk, how to walk, and why we should walk. Number three, please, Cheryl. Ways to walk. I must thank Holly for these lovely PowerPoints that you're seeing this morning. I can't take credit for them. So Holly came down for a visit and spent uh, all last night helping me, so that was greatly appreciated. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Join together in following my example. This is Paul speaking. Remember Paul's in prison, he's in chains, more likely chained to a guard, and he's a long way from the church at Philippi, probably a thousand odd kilometers, and he's writing this letter, join together in following my example. Brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. A question, we, we all need godly examples to model our Christian lives on, don't we? Who's that one person in your life, and we all have them, maybe there's two or three or four or five people throughout your life that you think back often and think, wow, if it wasn't for that person, I wouldn't be where I am today. If it wasn't for my Sunday school teacher who taught me those songs of biblical truths, if it wasn't for our youth group leaders that showed so much passion, it might have been a, a, a Christian school teacher or it may have been an elder or a pastor or a, a loving Christian that's just been there at the right time when you're going through something, through your teenage years, maybe through some difficult times. And don't we all go through those? I left school, I, I don't like to admit this too much, but it is true, I left school the day I turned 15. Not only did I leave school at 15, but I left home at 15. And I travelled, uh, I came from a small town in the King Country called Pew Pew, and I shifted to Hamilton, the big city, to do a building apprenticeship. And I had nowhere to stay. I was brought up in a, a home that took me to church, and, and uh, so, hey, this is, this is big. You know, through a connection, through my sister, through a friend of hers, a Christian family raised their hand and said, we live on a farm out at Gordington. If you need a few weeks to get settled in Hamilton, come and live with us. Very simple thing. So I did. Uh, Mum and Dad took me up to Hamilton and 
I moved in with the family called the Barlows. And Mr. and Mrs. Barlow were committed Christians, loved the Lord, and just fully active in their local church. And they took me in, my two or three weeks turned into two or three years of living with a loving Christian family that taught me so much about how God operates in a family, how God operates in the church and how we can serve him. And I am forever grateful. Just only, if I said months ago, it was probably a year or so ago, Mrs. Barlow passed away. I went to her funeral. Uh, Mr. Barlow passed away uh, about a year later. But right through their funeral service were a whole lot of people like me praising God for this couple. So people uh, impact us for Christ in our lives. In our verse here this morning, Paul did not say here, follow me and just follow me only. Remember, he's a thousand odd kilometers away. He's locked up. He's chained up. But he's urging the Philippi believers to follow his example and passion for preaching Christ. There are others who are walking on the right path too, Paul has instructed. Paul wants the Philippians to follow his example while also looking to other people who are walking the right path. As a result, I believe we need to find mentors in our world that we live in, that we can talk to, learn from, and follow. Do you have a Paul to look up to? Do you have a Timothy to imitate? Do you have an Epaphroditus to follow? Do you have a godly leader or hero to learn from? And do the people you look up to, spend time with and learn from, live up to the qualities Christ wants to see formed in you? Or do you need to seek a mentor more like Paul has in mind? We must be careful what we're following. I've said a lot about the importance of having godly, Christ-like role models in our lives. But to what extent are yourself role models for others? People are watching you, regardless. You are at a point, are you at a point in your relationship with Christ where other Christians might begin to look to you for advice, for your wisdom, and a pattern to follow? This wonderful church here at 109 has many faithful Christian role models. I can vouch for that. I lean on them a lot. And they're gifted and so encouraging. Their hearts are just open to uh, welcome and, and encourage and build up other people. Seek out Christ-like role models. Follow the example. Learn from and be encouraged from this type of person. We could have said, have a look at our fourth PowerPoint. How to walk. This is the one verse I probably could have easily have looked over, but it's here, and we must just to share some thoughts on it because it's more what I'd call the negative side of this morning and what I'm talking about. But it's very important, it happened, and we must learn and be careful we aren't in this group of people. Verse 18 of Philippians chapter 3. For as I have often told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, their mind is set on earthly things. Oh, man, that's a bit of a change, isn't it? Paul's in tears in the middle of a, this book of, of joy. Not only joy, but joy in the Lord. And here he is crying, what's going on? Did someone steal his banana out of his lunchbox? Or did, did someone say his mother dresses him funny or something and insult him? No. No, not at all. His tears are not for himself, but those he calls here the enemies of the cross or Christ. Because this is the only time in the Bible that we read of Paul in tears. Did you know that? He wasn't a crybaby. He, he got stoned practically to death. 
and we don't hear of them crying. And it's important to know what was so devastating that brought Paul to tears. It must have been pretty big. Who are the enemies of the cross? A question we must ask this morning. Well, Paul had a spiritual mind, but heartbroken over some that professed Christians in the way they were living. People who set their mind on earthly things. Paul is writing in verse 18 about professed Christians, not about people outside the church. He's talking to his church. I don't know how he had a church. He really got into them. He wasn't happy that there were people in there stirring problems. And more likely he is referring to the Judaizers. They were the enemies of the cross. And that they added the law of Moses to the work of redemption that Christ wrought on the cross. That we've remembered this morning in our very own church here. Of Jesus Christ dying for the sins of the world. Their obedience to the Old Testament, the Testament dietary laws made a God out of their belly. And the emphasis on circumcision would amount to glory in that about which they ought to be ashamed. These men were not spiritually minded, but they were holding on to earthly rituals, Old Testament rituals and beliefs that God had given Israel for another time. And you know, they they were even offended by the suggestion that salvation was all about grace. And that it excluded what they believed, which was the merit of their own good works. Could I just remind you of Paul's writing in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you have been saved. This is what they didn't get. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. That's what they didn't get. And Paul is correcting them. A question to us. Can you and I, and I put myself in these shoes, I I don't mean to be standing up here and and challenging people. This has been a real challenge for me. Can you and I fall into the trap of making a god of our stomach and finding glory in our shame? And can our minds be set on earthly things as Christians within our church here at 109? There is that possibility. We can if our eyes are not focusing on Jesus Christ and we start focusing on what life, focusing on a life that is lived for self-satisfaction. And that can mean a lot of things. How we see Christianity, how we see doing things. Remember, Paul had just said in an earlier verse, many of you. So he's saying many in his church at Philippi had this view. They wanted to add on to what Christ had done for them. Romans 16, 17 and 18. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in the way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk, flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. This is what Paul is just warning his congregation of. And it's not just talking about stomachs and food. It's about our stomach as what we're taking into our life, into our bodies, what we're consuming. Self-satisfaction. Man, isn't that our generation today? Our generation is pleasure-crazed. It feels good, do it. Following the world with sinful desires, pursuing ill-gained wealth, seeking success and prestige at any cost, feeding our belly on the sinful desires, inappropriate entertainment, relationships, is another way we can start feeding our belly on worldly food that puts us away from godly living. And it also pulls us away from reading our Bibles. It pulls us away from our relationships within church and it pulls us away from even wanting to come on Sunday morning feeding on worldly pleasures. So what does this glory in their shame mean when Paul said they were glorying in their shame? 
Well, I work with some pretty tough cookies at work. And on a Monday night when I catch up with a lot of us at depots, you hear of people glorying in their shame. I did this, 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 this in the weekend. Yeah, you know, great stuff. And it's shameful, shameful behavior and they're glorying in it. That is what it means by glorying in your shame. Thinking something bad is good. Something is evil is great. What is a gay pride parade? It's glorying in shame. I'm not attacking the people here. I'm just saying all that activity, all that celebration is glorying in shame that's against God's will. First John says, love not the world, and if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. Man, they're heavy words. They're challenging to me. This is, verse is a very strong condemnation on those who claim to be saved, but don't act like it. And Paul weeps over these people. That's what Paul is weeping over. People saying they're one thing, that they're Christians, they belong to Christ, but they live in another way. And I think that can challenge any one of us. Listen to Paul's warning. Never live as enemies of the cross. God doesn't need anything added or taken away from his plan of salvation. Jesus Christ died for you and I because of God's love and his mercy and his grace. Nothing else, nothing we can do. The Bible says to examine ourselves and work out our salvation with fear and trembling with that in mind. 1 John 3, 1 and 10 gives us the marks of a true Christian. They practice righteousness. They love other Christians in spite of differences and they are never content to remain in a sinful nature or in a sinful state. And that's where we want to be this morning, church. Righteous living, loving others and never content to remain in our sin. Paul said in verse 18, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Be alert, church family. So with all that behind us, that was a bit of the, the negative stuff. That was what Paul's warning. Beware of, of that lifestyle. Beware of these people. We're trying to build a church around the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and the love of God in this church. So be aware of people that are contrary to that. If we could have a look at our fifth PowerPoint, please. Why to walk? But our citizenship, and I spoke, I touched on this a few weeks ago when I spoke, so, uh, actually I think I used this verse. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Isn't that an amazing verse? Praise God. We're focusing this morning on walk this way. Paul needed to warn the Philippians in the contrast of the two paths, the path of the enemies in the church or within the church in verse 18 and the path of believers uh, who we are and we walk as in verse 20. Our hope is heaven-bound citizens of Christ's kingdom. May that be an encouragement to you this morning. We're bound for heaven. Remember the lost. Set their minds on earthly things. But believers set their minds on things above. That's exactly what that's saying. So how do we do this? We're always looking forward. We're always looking upward, eagerly awaiting the coming of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Each one of us as Christians have a dual citizenship. We are both earthly and we're both heavenly. Praise the Lord for that. We're citizens of both. We're both Kiwis, but we're also children of God. And since we are citizens of heaven, then there's the imperative, we must live like it. Our lives must live in the manner that reflects the value of the supreme worth of the gospel that we've remembered this morning. The day that each of us accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, the Bible tells us that we were born again. We have a new spirit come within us. 
And my brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're here in church at 109, if you're in the TV uh, church next door, or you're online listening to this this morning, and you identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and have accepted him through faith as your Lord and Saviour, great news. We all have our citizenship in heaven. We all have our own passport. Our names are written in heaven because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on that old wooden cross at Calvary that we've remembered this morning. Our heavenly passport has not been processed in some government department. It's not in the post. It's not in the courier. And it's not even waiting until you get to heaven. Your passport is in your possession right now. You have it. That's got to be really exciting, doesn't it? Yeah, amen. While we're citizens of heaven, we still have to live on earth in this beautiful town of Taupo. And there's tension to be managed here. We need to live with the values and goals of our heavenly life while also existing here in the sinful materialistic world. These are the two sets of values and cultures that clash. Thus we need to depend on the spirit and focus on living as citizens of heaven here on earth. 20b, and we eagerly await a saviour. It should be the hope of the second coming of Christ that gives us meaning and value to life in the present. It is the hope in the second coming of Christ and the power to transform our bodies and to subject all things to himself that gives us the reason to live like Paul and imitate Christ. Rather than those like in Philippi, whose end, this is what Paul said, their end was destruction. And whose God was their belly, and whose glory was their shame. And they set their minds on earthly things. Hallelujah, Jesus is coming back. And we should eagerly be awaiting our Saviour. If I could just have a look at our sixth slide. Cheryl, thank you. I've just put a couple of, from the verses we've read, bad examples of living, good examples of living. Just gives us something to cross-reference here through the scripture we've just read in verse 18. These people were enemies of the cross. That was Paul was referring to. We are to be embraces of the cross. They were on a path to destruction. We're on a path to sanctification where we're growing towards our heavenly destination where we're growing in Christ every day, day by day. They idolize their appetite. We subdue our appetite through Christ. That glory in their shame, we should be mourning over our sin and our shame. They set their minds on worldly things. And as I've just said, we should be setting our minds on heavenly things. Could just go to slide seven, please, Cheryl. Just so, just to wrap this up, I started off this morning by introducing the topic of walk this way. Now I want to finish the message in Philippians with some encouragement and ways to walk. I trust that through God's Holy Spirit, this morning's message causes you a desire to walk in a righteous way. As Paul has encouraged the Philippi believers, ways to walk. Are you following good examples? It's a good question to ask. Find those people in your life that are going to encourage your walk with Jesus. They're everywhere. Find them. They're not hard to find in this church. Are you eagerly anticipating the coming of Christ? Do you live today by the principles of the true, your true heavenly home? Are you thinking along those lines? Are you thinking of glory? We should be. We've got our citizenship. We've got our passport. Our names are written in heaven. With the enemies of the cross, those people that are against what we're doing and against always coming up with problems and issues with the way the Bible describes our salvation and, and what's happening and the living in the world and they don't really care. Would the enemies of the cross know that this world is not your home? Or do you just blend in, compromise, and are you hiding the tr your tr 
true identity in Christ. We don't want to do that. Are there areas in your life that verse 19 warns us to flee from? Is your lifestyle, this is a big question, this is challenging for me, is your lifestyle having a negative impact on you or on others or someone in your life? Tough question, eh? But we should ask it. And if so, what do you need to do to change that? I just want to read, I found this verse, it's a really good one, I haven't got it up, if, if, if you're taking notes, Galatians 5 verse 16, an awesome, awesome verse. If you're struggling with sin or there's something in your life and you just can't break that habit in it, so you just think, oh, why do I keep going back or doing this or saying those things so that people are feeling that way, Galatians 5 16 will be an encouragement to you this morning. So I say, walk by the Spirit. So that's given us our direction. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Isn't that a wonderful verse? You will not gratify the desires of your flesh if you're walking in the Spirit. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I urge you to change direction in your life's walk. Repent. Change direction. It's like a railway track. You don't sort of go down a railway track and sort of slip off into here. Or you either go that way or you're going that way. Railway tracks don't change direction. You are either on God's side or you're going against God, following the devil's way. So if you are not, have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you to change the direction. Get off the wide road and onto the narrow path. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ this morning brothers and sisters, is the way, the truth and the life. Follow him. Number eight, changing direction in your life involves walking away from self and turn to the saviour of the world. My second point, get off the wide road that leads to destruction and follow the narrow path to Jesus. My third point, come to Jesus and walk even as he walked. You'll get a walking theme here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Submit to him. And listen to this, and he will make your path straight. Man, you've got God on your side. Your paths are going to be straight like those railway tracks. But you just want to make sure you go in the right direction. In Psalm 37, 23, I love this verse. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. If you're on God's side, you're honoring him. God's going to direct your way. Each of us this morning, and that includes me, have to take a serious look into the path we're walking along sometimes. Some of us need to decide whether we need to change the path, change direction, or change the way we walk. If the Holy Spirit is challenging this morning, don't, don't ignore God's prompting. Submit all your ways to him. Only be obedient to Jesus Christ will allow him to make your paths straight. And slide nine. Shall we just close in prayer? Father God, we just thank you for Paul and his message this morning to the Philippi Church. We've had some challenging thoughts to work through this morning. We just ask, Lord, that you will work in each of our hearts and that each of us can consider the changes we need to to get right with God, to stop feeding our own belly with the desires of the world, but to be filling our heart, mind, and spirit with every good thing that comes from you. Bless each one here this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. or cold drink um, and also just a reminder that um, Phil and his lovely wife Bronwyn are going to be here at the front and if you would like to respond in any way about the message this morning or about anything that you'd like someone to pray alongside you with they'll be really happy to do that so thank you everybody lovely to see you